Merry Christmas from my house to your house. This is my Christmas tree. You can tell from all the lovely Christmas gnomes. I read recently someone asked the question, if a Christmas tree falls and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Absolutely it makes a sound. The sound is meow because we all know the cat knocked it over. Maybe your Christmas hasn't felt very hallmark. Well, the very first Christmas wasn't very hallmark either. I want to read a passage from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. Because there was no guest room available for them. My whole family was riding in the car the other day, and we were singing the song Last Christmas, Top of Our Lungs. Me, Suzanne, Caleb, Connor, Colton, the dog wasn't there, but she would have been singing it as well if she had the opportunity. And we got to that part where it says, this year, to save it from tears, I'm going to give it to someone special. And all of a sudden, Colton yells out from the back, he's our nine-year-old, maybe like baby Jesus. He knows who to give the heart to. This Christmas, we want to invite you to give your heart to God, just as God gave his heart to us through Jesus. We hope that you enjoy this Christmas Eve service that we're playing for you right now, and we hope that it blesses you and you open your hearts and make room for Jesus in your lives. Merry Christmas. Please stay warm. What's up, everybody? So I just wanted to ask you guys, if you were curious and wanted to know who the diehard Christmas Eve church service fans are, take a look around the room. Because nothing says, I'm a diehard Christmas Eve service fan, like people that will come out in sub-zero temperatures. And I want to say a shout out to all the parents that brought their kids out in sub-zero temperatures. It makes them tougher. If you want them to survive the Midwest, you got to do it when they're young. Amen? So you all know whose birthday we're here to celebrate today. Kyle just had a birthday this week. Him and Daryl. Yep, so happy birthday to them. Anybody else? Nobody shouted Jesus? Weird. I'm going to have to help you guys today. Oh, Sacramento. Do you have a birthday? Everybody's pointing at you like you had a birthday, so we're just going to skirt over that right now. But I want to say thank you all to coming out because we did have like some severe warnings about our weather, but isn't that how Wisconsin goes? I heard like 14 inches and I heard it was going to be a brief dusting. Either way, bring it on. We're used to it. No warnings. Um, but I want to say thank you. And the way we're going to say thank you is if you look in the seat in front of you, there's a little pocket. All right? Look, go ahead and look in that little pocket. And if you see some wise men in there, I want you to come up because Kyle is going to give you a gift card. Are you kidding me? Come on. That's amazing. Marshall, did you get one? Yeah, come on up. No, literally, I mean, how could you rig that? <laughs> I'll be honest, if it was rigged, we were watching where Marshall sat, and we just put it there, because who doesn't want to give Marshall a gift on Christmas? So how many of you guys have that ride-or-die buddy that if you're going on an adventure, this is the one person that you want to go with? Does anybody have that person? Well, you guys just saw my beautiful wife come up here, and that's, that's my ride-or-die buddy. But when you have your ride-or-die buddy, one of the two is going to be the leader. Am I right? So we like to go hiking, and we like to do things like that as a family. And a few years back, we went to Tennessee, and now we've conquered Colorado. Like, we went to Colorado, and we hit some great trails, and we were doing six-mile hikes, which isn't impressive, but we were pretty good at it. So we went to Tennessee as a family, and we were going to go do a hike, and Danielle's like, it's just a mile. I'm like, oh. And she's like, we've done six, so that's one-sixth the distance. So it should be no big deal. And I don't know if you guys know me. I'll follow my wife anywhere. My kids might not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I will. So we start off on this journey. And you know how some trails are? They're nice. They're fun. This one was uphill the whole way. And you would think, but it's in the Smoky Mountains. So there's beautiful scenery, right? No, this one didn't. It was all trees. It was the same view. And it was a steady mile incline the whole way. And to say my wife 
was leading us, you know, and then we'll follow her anywhere. But my daughter really wasn't happy with mom at that moment. So we, we had to work through some family issues afterwards. But I say all that to say this. When we got to where we were going, it was worth it. She led us to this beautiful waterfall. We had to go through it to get to it. But it was amazing once we got there. So it was like, all right, honey, you were, you were right. It was worth the trip. So let's hear it for my wife. And, and let's, hear it. let's hear it for all those people that lead us on crazy adventures that if we don't go through it, we won't get to see the beauty, right? Well, Christmas is all about that. Christmas is all about people traveling. And, you know, you think about these guys when we're reading the Bible and talking about the Magi and the wise men and the shepherds and all that. They had to travel to get to Jesus. And I always wonder, like, when I read the Bible, I'm like, I wonder if one of those guys was like my wife. Like the wise men, if they were all like on board, they knew where they were going, or if it was like one dude stood up and be like, just trust me, follow me. Like, Fred, I don't think this is the way to go. I'm sure his name wasn't Fred. But you, you, you got to wonder, like, Fred, are you sure? He goes, no, I, trust me, I promise. And the shepherds, you know, they had their job to do. Like, they got to take care of the sheep. And you got to wonder if there was like one guy's like, hey, we should go this way. Phil, we got to watch the sheep. Like, no, trust me, we need to go. And we need to see this because it's going to be exciting. And so those guys risked it. They went for it. And what did they get to see? They got to see Jesus. And when they're there, even the angels show up. And, you know, we always talk about the angels, and it's exciting because you think, oh, they're cute. They've got wings, and they're, they're happy guys. And I'm like, no, if you read Revelations, you find out that these dudes are fierce warriors. So these guys get there, and you've got the fiercest warriors of heaven came down to see baby Jesus be born. And then you got dirty shepherds that left their post, so they're not good employees, <laughs> and they came to see Jesus, and it just shows the beauty that we can all come together to Jesus at this moment. It doesn't matter if you're coming down from heaven. It doesn't matter if you're coming up from the fields. It doesn't matter where we come from. Jesus is like, I want everybody, all wealth, all races, all people, all statures, all intelligence. I want everybody at my birthday party. So looking around this room, I'm excited to see you guys all today. So I'm going to read a verse, and then we are going to watch a video, and then we're going to stay in together and worship Jesus. Are you guys excited? All right, let's do it. So after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Do you remember your first trip to the planetarium? Probably with your third grade class. More excited to leave school than actually learn anything about science. You know who you were. You find your seat, impatiently waiting for the show to start, ignoring the withering look of your teacher. And then... Wow. Incredible. How can we be so small, but so special? That is, I believe how the wise men must have felt. These magi got quite the star show themselves. Except, it was just one star. One bright, magnificent, piercing, brilliant ball of fire. And boy, did they bet a lot on that star. But just like the one they were traveling to see, this star stood out as something special. This one beckoned, follow me. And what a payoff. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they asked, where is the one born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. And it got me thinking, is worship a little different the harder the journey to get there, struggling along the road with others, the type of trip that tests your faith and breaks your back. What's that worship like? I can't speak for the wise men. Maybe they shouted hallelujah, or they knelt in quiet reverence. We've all walked our own difficult journeys. And when we got to the other side, we all felt it. The joy we had to fight for tasted just a bit sweeter. And for that bright morning star, the one that caught you in awe when you saw it, well, 
what else can you do but rejoice when you realize that the journey is always leading you to Jesus. All right, you guys can go ahead and stand for some worship. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing.
joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation, sing all ye sing. about celebrating your birth, celebrating the fact that you came, that you came for us, for each person in this room, each person that watches online. God, you came for each one of us. And tonight, Father, we celebrate you in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. It was the week before Christmas, and at Cheryl and Steve's place, a look of awe hit their friend Edward right in the face. Wow, you really went all out. <sighs> Going all out is what we're all about. Mm -hmm. All year we can't wait for Christmas to begin. Well, if Christmas were a competition, you two would surely win. <laughs> I mean, we got the tree, we got the lights, we got all the Christmas sights. Yeah, you even have uh, Bing Crosby and some uh, festive tights. We've got all the Christmas glee, from that choo-choo train there to this. Merry embroidery. 
you all were doing it with the Bing Crosby. <laughs> we decked the halls with shimmering snow. All the gifts and, well, little Miss Taylor. Not now, babe. As you can see, Christmas is all about the bouquet. That's why we go all the way. Mm -hmm. Which way? The way. All the way. Well, I don't think this is the way. Question our way, you say? Babe. Well, well there's, there's only one way. One way? What way, you say? Well, his way. Wait, I'm sorry. Whose way? God, God's way? No way. Yes way. Who say? Yahweh. Wait, no play? No play, I mean what I say. Should we, we delay? delay? <laughs> Do it today. Okay. You see, Jesus, God's son, said I am the way, the truth, and the life. I, I'm sorry, we don't mean to cause strife. This is just a lot for me and my wife. It's okay. It can be hard giving everything over to God, but he can change anything, no matter how flawed. And Christmas is the perfect time to join God's squad. Okay. Yeah. But can we still have the sweaters, the carols, and the Christmas cookies? What about these? I'm sorry. My husband and I, we seem mm. to be rookies. Have all the fun, Cheryl and Stephen. But just remember that Jesus, he's the reason for the season. Jesus came to earth for you and me. He paid the ransom to set us free. I've never heard such a rhyme. Your words, your heart, all sublime. Huh. Thank you for choosing to assist us. My pleasure. Hey, Merry Christmas. Matthew chapter two. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. When I told Joseph that we should travel more, I didn't mean when I was nine months pregnant. My belly looks like Mount Sinai. It feels like Jesus is trying to walk on water in there. I have heartburn so bad I am halfway convinced this child is trying to make his way up through my esophagus and my bladder is killing me. I mean, who wouldn't want to get out of Nazareth? But not when you can't even touch your own toes and your walk is more of a waddle. I could really go for a sleigh and some reindeer right now because this donkey is super uncomfortable. Let me tell you, I have been downwind of this guy for weeks, and Dominic here does not smell like Christmas. I can't wait to check into a five-star inn and leave the smell of animals far, far behind. You know, being a carpenter, Joseph doesn't make a lot of money, so normally we'd go the frugal route and just crash at a relative's house. But... I'm giving birth to the son of the Most High, so I want to make sure I do this right. I'm picturing a master suite, you know, 1,500 thread count Egyptian cotton sheets, <laughs> uh, dim lights, a spa-like atmosphere, peace, quiet, and calm so thick that even a little drummer boy couldn't spoil it. 80 miles is a long way to travel for a census, but when the emperor of Rome says go, you go, even if you are carrying the king of kings. At the same time, it's kind of nice to get away, you know, somewhere I can just be Mary or Joseph's wife instead of the crazy woman or the lying liar of loose moral character. Yeah, good one, guys. I mean, don't get me wrong, I completely understand why no one believes me. If it wasn't for the angel, I'm not sure I would believe me. So I get the looks, the stares, the snide comments. Hey, girl, remind me, which comes first, your due date or your wedding anniversary? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's not just me. I see the looks they give Joseph, and it breaks my heart because he's been the perfect gentleman. 
caring, steadfast, faithful. I couldn't ask for anything more. And I thank God every day for Joseph. However, I am getting a little bit nervous right now because that palm tree we just passed looks really familiar. And our people are not known for their sense of direction. Our ancestors got lost in the desert for 40 years on a trip that was supposed to take 11 days. And now Joseph here keeps telling me not to worry and that he's a regular Magellan. But I don't know who that is or what that's supposed to mean. If only there was a star we could follow. I just don't understand why God would allow us to be sent on such a difficult journey now. I miss my cousin Elizabeth. I wish I could send her a Christmas card and see how she's doing. And I really wish we could have just stayed with her instead of traveling all the way to Bethlehem. And now I'm homesick and morning sick, which is not the best combination. And of course, that means that now is the perfect time for baby boy to practice his headstands right into my ribs. Okay. Oh, finally, we made it to the inn. Um, Joseph's going to go inside and get us a room. So I'm going to take advantage of this motionless moment and catch up on some scripture reading. I think I'm in... Micah 5.2 two today. Okay, Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem. Ha! Huh, that's funny. We're in Bethlehem right now. What are the odds? Ah, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over all of Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Wow. Micah wrote this 700 years ago. He wrote about a king coming out of Bethlehem. I'm pregnant with a king, and we're in Bethlehem right now. You know, maybe we didn't travel all this way for a census. Maybe we're here to fulfill prophecy. Maybe we didn't go because of the emperor. Maybe we're here because of God. I can't wait to share this with Joseph. May your word be fulfilled. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas to those who are at home as well as those who are here. So good to see everyone in spite of how cold it is outside. The weather outside is frightful, but guess what? Inside, it is so delightful. Uh, kids, I want you guys to fill in the blank for me. Dashing through the... And a worn horse open sleigh. Over the fields we go. Laughing all the way. Notice that snow and laughing go hand in hand. How many of you felt that way about the snow last night? You weren't laughing all the way. I can tell who you are. How many of you love snow? Yeah, we got a few hands. You could live in the North Pole. Uh, you love the Christmas song, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow. Or if you're a 90s kid, Ice, Ice, Baby, Too Cold, Too Cold. I saw some dancing. How many of you hate snow? Oh, so bitter, so bitter. Uh, you're not even sure why God made a northern hemisphere. You would be okay if it snowed on December 25th and melted on December 26th. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. Syracuse, New York, tried to make a law in 1992. This is for real. They tried to make a law that it could not snow before Christmas Eve. They tried to make it illegal. Two days after they passed the law, it snowed because the snow is rebellious. And people say politicians can't get anything done. Each winter in the U.S., one septillion ice crystals fall from the sky. To give you some perspective, that's how many Reese's Christmas trees Pastor Jason could eat in one sitting. That's right. While not all adults love snow, many kids do. How many of you kids love snow? Yeah. How many of you kids love snowball fights? 
Woo! Snow angels. Sledding. Building snow forts. Skipping school because of snow day. Yeah, that's holiday. There could be a light dusting, and my nine-year-old be like, Dad, we got to build a snowman. There's not even enough for a snow head. <laughs> We're not going to get a whole snowman out of this, buddy. When we look at this picture I'm going to show you up here, adults see work. Kids see wonder. Adults see work, kids see wonder. We're looking at the same picture, but we have two very different reactions. And it was the same way on the first Christmas. Let's stand and read our theme verse this morning or afternoon. Luke chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. You may be seated. Everyone say, manger. manger. I want you to look at this picture. Is it just me or does that look crowded? That is a very crowded nativity scene. Poor Mary is the only one in the room, only girl in the room. Fortunately, that's not exactly how it looked in the first century for our first Christmas. Thank God for Mary. The first Christmas might not have had snow, it might not have had snowmen, but it had a lot of experiences that would have felt kind of bad. And I want to explain a scenario, and I want you to say bah humbug if it's something that you wouldn't have been excited about. Having to travel from Bethlehem to Nazareth on a donkey or by foot when you're nine months pregnant. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. I want to show you guys a picture of that travel. So we're talking a long distance to be going. Now imagine you're a teenage girl, and you're about to give birth to your first child. And we're not told exactly how old Mary is. There's no, like, birthday in the scriptures. Jewish girls could get engaged at the age of 12 in the first century and married at the age of 13. Now my mom wouldn't let me date at 13. She wanted me to wait until I was, like, 30. So 13 seems pretty young to me. People didn't typically live as long, though, and so they tended to get married earlier. We know that Mary shows some maturity. She is called one who is highly favored, the only person in the entire Bible to get that title. She is highly favored, and she's called that by the angel Gabriel. She shows the maturity. She quotes from the Old Testament 10 different times when she does that, does that impromptu song when she's so excited about being pregnant with baby Jesus and she sings a song that's the Magnificat, Mary's Magnificat. She does tw 10 times. She quotes from Scripture, which means she knew the Bible very well. And she will travel all the way to go visit her cousin Elizabeth, which was 80 miles away. So there's some maturity that's there. Scholars will estimate that she was between the age of 13 and 16, but top end is 16 years old. So she's a teen. She's a teen as she's going through these experiences. Now imagine that you're a teenage girl and you're in your third trimester. I don't know if you know this, but that's when a walk becomes a waddle. You're self-conscious about your weight and how you look. You're consistently craving angel food cake because you got baby Jesus. You've prepared the nursery. The baby's due any moment, and Joseph comes home and says, Hey, babe, I've got some good news. We're going to Bethlehem, the city of David. We've always wanted to go. This is so exciting. She wants to yell at him, but she can't say what she wants to because baby Jesus. Right? Joseph obviously has never heard the phrase, happy wife, happy life. Mary is not happy right now. He might as well have brought her home a Christmas present wrapped in the type of paper that has glitter on it. How many of you guys like glitter wrapping paper? It's pretty, but it will be with you for another 365 days. So next Christmas, we'll still find glitter on you. What's the longest distance that you have ever walked? Go ahead and say it. Longest distance you've ever walked. 10 miles, 
93 miles. Wow. I heard a lot of people say, to the TV. 30 on a hike. Woo! I did 12 miles one time. Not the 90 or the 30. Slacker. 12 miles, and at the end of it, I was ready for my wife to carry me into the car because I was like, I don't want to walk anymore. Like, ever again. That's why I want to sit tonight. I don't want to walk ever again. Mary will travel 80 miles, the same distance that she traveled to Elizabeth's house, very different location. She'll travel 80 miles, but this time now she'll be nine months pregnant. Imagine, nine months pregnant, she's going to walk 80 miles and may travel on a donkey. We're not told specifically. I don't know if, about you, but that doesn't sound very exciting to me. She will travel over the mountains of Cana, through the wilderness of Judea, this isn't just like a clear, paid path. This is a dangerous trip, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be arduous. Next question. Having to give birth in a barn. Bah humbug. Thank you, Lucy. Bah humbug. Now, a lot of kids act like they were born in a barn. Some parents know that's right. How many of you kids can make a cow sound? Moo. What does a cat do? What does a dog do? What does mommy do? Yeah. <laughs> I know who's getting cold in the morning. <laughs> For Jesus, he truly was born, and I'm going to put this in quotation marks, in a barn. Everybody see the quotation marks. He was born in a barn. And I, and I do that because there's things that we know and there's things that we don't know. We know he was placed in a manger. Everyone say manger. And I'm going to show you a picture of a manger because I think we confuse what a manger is. A manger is simply a long box that is used to feed horses and cattle. It's what they eat out of. And so we often think of the manger scene, but the manger is really just the box that an animal will eat out of. Now, can you imagine giving birth to your first child and their first crib is going to be a food box for an animal? Now, sure, if it's your third kid, but not the first one. By the third one, you're like, whatever. But the first one, they get royalty, right? Now, the reason why, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 7, is there was no room in the inn. Now, when we hear the word inn, we think of a hotel, some type of business or a building. There was a little kid. He was in a play. True story. And uh, he was supposed to play Joseph, but he kept acting up, and so he got demoted to innkeeper. He went from Joseph to innkeeper as a punishment. And so when all of a sudden it became the big night, and they're going to put on this production, and everyone's there, everyone's excited. They get to the moment where Mary and Joseph ask, is there any room in the inn? To which he's supposed to say, there's no room in the inn. But instead, because he's mad, he says, yes, there's lots of room in the end. Please come on in. We got a special place just for you. For a little Mary and Joseph were like, we don't know what to do. <laughs> so when we think of it, and we often think of like a hotel. But the Greek word that Luke uses for the word in, when he's talking about the Good Samaritan, he uses the word for hotel. But when he's talking about this moment here, he uses a very different word, and it's a word that's used for a guest room. It's not a hotel. It's a guest room. Now, typically in a first century Jewish home, there would have been an upper room, which would have been the guest room or used as a guest room. And I'm going to show you a picture of a replica of a first century home. So you notice that there's the first floor, and then there's a second floor. And on the second floor, there was a guest room. That is what is referred to as the inn that Luke is referring to, okay? So, because of the census, it's packed out. Nobody has any room in their guest rooms, and so she places them in a manger. Now, this could mean one of two things. So, we know what he's placed in, but we don't know the context of where he's placed. One, they could have stayed in a cave, we know through archaeology that in Bethlehem, they would use caves as a place for their animals, and that would be kind of like their barn, okay? So it's possible they stayed in a cave that night. Not very exciting. But it's also possible 
that they would have stayed on the first floor of one of those homes because in the wintertime, the animals were allowed to come into the home and stay on the first floor to keep them healthy and warm and safe. How many of you kids want some farm animals living in your living room? Got some hands going up. You know what to get them, parents, for Christmas. So, whatever the situation, whether it's on the first floor with the animals or it's in a cave, this is not the ideal place to have your first kid, right? How many of you would say, bah humbug to that? Bah humbug. I'm pretty sure that's when Febreze was invented. How many of you kids, when you're going to, (laughs) skip that, not the kids, when you're about to have a baby, (laughs) you adults who feel like kids, when you're about to have a baby, there's a lot of thought that goes into where you're going to have that first child, right? We drove all the way from Zion all the way to Lake Forest for our first child. We passed a lot of hospitals to have that first baby. But my wife was determined that Lake Forest was the best place to have our pride and joy. What if I would have stopped at a barn and I was like, babe, it's good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for us. I would not be here to preach this sermon tonight. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I would have been out with the animals. (laughs) Now imagine you're a teenage girl. This is your first child. There's no epidurals. There's no nursing staff. You don't even have a decent place to lay your firstborn baby, and you're stuck with livestock. You're stuck with the livestock. Now, having no family around for support, notice in the manger scene of the nativity, who's not there? No mom, no dad, no in-laws, no uncles, no aunts, no family. This would not have felt like a good thing. Everyone say, bah humbug. Imagine you leave a good home, and you travel all the way there, 80 miles, to face this. Next question. Having a bunch of non-related dudes show up at the manger. How many of you would say that that's a bow humbug? Absolutely. Who were the first ones to show up for the birth of Jesus? Shepherds. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. But let's stop at Ikea on the way to make sure we get a gift to bring to baby Jesus. It doesn't say that. The first people to show up are stinky, non-gift-bringing shepherds. The only thing they bring is a story about angels coming to sing to them, and she must have been like, I would rather the angels. But it's the shepherds who show up. The wise men don't show up until two years later. I know in nativity scenes we show them all together, but that didn't happen. The wise men show up about two years later. And one of the reasons why we know this, and there's a few different things, but one of the reasons why we know this is because when Mary and Joseph go to prepare the sacrifice at the temple for their firstborn son, what kind of animal are they supposed to sacrifice? A lamb. Thank you, Lucy. But what is it that they sacrifice? There was an exception made for the very poor, and it was two turtle doves and a partridge in a bear tree. Two turtle doves. So they sacrificed the sacrifice of the poor, not the lamb, which would have been normal. Think about it. When the wise men came, they brought what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which would have been a huge financial upgrade. If they had already shown up, they could have afforded the lamb and would have bought the lamb out of Jewish obligation, but they buy the turtle doves or give the turtle doves because they're in a position of poverty or they are poor. The only ones there are shepherds, not family, not friends, shepherds. Some scholars believe that these shepherds were the same ones who would have been out in the field to protect the sheep that were used for sacrifice at the temple. And that their showing up was symbolic that Jesus was going to be the final lamb that was slain. The temple would no longer be needed. They would be out of a job. But that's not who you want showing up for your baby shower. That means a lot to us. 
But for Mary, that's not who you want showing up. Next question. How many of you would have liked to have run for Egypt just after giving birth? Bah, humbug. Woo! Lucy's my favorite. She gets two candy canes afterwards. <laughs> Christmas has more traditions than any other holiday. I'm going to name a tradition. And kids, if you love it, I want you to say Merry Christmas. Kids, you on board? Yeah. yeah. Singing Christmas songs. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Opening presents. Merry Christmas. Oh, eating cookies. Making gingerbread houses. Waking your parents up at 5 in the morning to open presents. And the parents all said? <laughs> bah humbug. <laughs> Something, we, <laughs> it's going to happen. You guys are in trouble. Something we don't incorporate into our Christmas tradition is running for our life. Unless your older sibling gets something that you really want, and then you chase each other around trying to see who gets to play with it first. Jesus' family will have to run for their lives after the first Christmas. In Whoville, who was it that tried to steal Christmas? The Grinch. Here's a picture. This is the OG or the original Grinch. Woo. Every Who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch, who lived just north of who Bill did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one know, quite knows the reason. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight, or it could be that his head wasn't screwed on just right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was which is a very serious medical condition. In the original Christmas story, who was it that tried to steal Christmas? Herod. But I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> Whether right or wrong, say it loud and proud. Crunch! Or Herod. One of the two. It was Herod. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. He grows up to be the bread of life. But he doesn't grow up in Bethlehem. He grows up in Egypt all because of one man. In Matthew chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? Notice this is King Herod that they're talking to. And they're like, hey, where's the one born King of the Jews? And he's like looking at himself like, uh, I'm the king. All right. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was like, Merry Christmas! No, he was disturbed. He was disturbed. Herod was about as excited as Frosty the Snowman is to visit the desert. Or I would be to watch the Muppets, Muppets Christmas Carol again and again and again and again. I'm glad you do. One of us in this room doesn't. And he's holding the microphone. <laughs> Jesus was a threat to his throne, a threat to his status and security. If Jesus was king, then that meant he could no longer be the dictator of his own life. Shouldn't the Magi worship him? He's the king. Herod was the original Scrooge. Herod tries to destroy the first Christmas. If Jesus is king, then he can no longer be king. Everyone say, bah humbug. Let's look at the manger scene for a moment. When we look at the manger scene, we don't see the whole thing. When we sing silent night, holy night, we don't feel the full weight of what Mary and Joseph are going through. We see Christmas, they see Christ's mess. They see all of the troubles surrounding this scene. And what's interesting to me is when we look at this scene, we see Mary... We see Joseph, we see the shepherds, we see angels, we see the star, we see animals. But there's one person you don't see. Someone we don't always think about, and it's God the Father. He's the stranger in the manger for some of us. 
God the Father who is behind all of the inconvenience is this invisible hand, and he's orchestrating the whole thing. These people would never have met if it wasn't for God. A census gets Mary and Joseph there. A choir of angels gets the shepherds there. A star gets the wise men there. God is orchestrating all of this. 700 years before Jesus shows up on the scene, a prophet by the name of Isaiah speaks these words. He says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. These will be his royal titles. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus voluntarily takes a demotion so that we get an undeserved promotion. He shrinks down to the size of a grain of sand, smaller, ten times smaller than the cursor on your computer. All to bring about God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness. But a part of that miracle is Mary going through morning sickness. Stretch marks, rejection from friends and family. No one quite understanding. Traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And here's that picture again. And then giving birth in a barn. God never promised that his plan was going to be glamorous. He just said that it would be glorious. It would be hard. When we look at the story even closer, we realize that God with Mary meant that they would have to leave friends and family and run for Egypt. But God with Mary also meant that he would send the Magi who would travel from the east. They would travel a great distance to bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which would be a huge financial boost to help them with those travels. He would provide for them. Where God guides, he provides. God with Mary meant that even though Herod tried to kill her baby, an angel shows up in the middle of the night and warns them so that they can flee. God with Mary meant that even though they had to travel 80 miles while pregnant, it means that we only have to take one step towards Jesus to be reunited with God, to experience that forgiveness. I've been thinking about this verse a lot. I'm going to read it for you, Isaiah 64, 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hands. We try to reverse it and make God the clay and make him into our image. But that doesn't work. He's shaping our lives. And how many of you guys like to make snowmen? Show of hands. How many like to make snowmen? Before Olaf, and do you remember in the 1990s, the Campbell Soup Snowman? Yes. Before that, I grew up with the 1950s Frosty the Snowman. Anybody remember him? Yes. With the corn cob pipe which I never understood. Why did they have fire with a snowman? Makes no sense to me. But anyways, every year in Zurich, Switzerland, the way in which they end winter is they build a snowman and then they blow it up. As a way of saying winter is over. When I first read about that, I was like, wow, that's kind of extreme. But then last night happened. And I was like, I want to build a snowman, get some dynamite, and blow it up if that will end winter. Anyone behind me? Yeah, let's do it. Not right this second, but let's do it. Some people are better at making snowmen. Than How many of you guys are, like, good at building snowmen? I mean, you're sitting next to someone that's not quite as good at building snowmen. Yeah, we got a few hands, a few people pointing. Yeah. Here's a couple pictures of some snowmen. Aw. Aw. Ah, what happened? We went great, great, great. Uh, we don't know what happened there. It's interesting to me how a master artist can take the same material and end up with very different images, very different works of art. When we place our lives into God's hands and we remove it from our own hands, we're putting it into the hands of a master artist. Someone who could take all the mess and turn it into a masterpiece. You think about a snowman, it is made up of millions of non-symmetrical snowflakes. Imperfect snowflakes that then turn into something beautiful. God can take the brokenness in your life, the mistakes that you've made, the failures, the guilt, and he can turn even those things and he can make something beautiful 
out of it. Amen? God has taken all of the inconvenience and turning it into something of significance. You have no idea what God wants to orchestrate through your life this Christmas. He's just asking you to trust him. Maybe you hate the way your life looks these days, but he's just saying, trust me, put your life into my hand. We need to let the one who shaped the first Christmas shape our Christmas and shape our lives. The one who could bring Magi from the east, Mary and, Naz- and, and Joseph from Nazareth, the shepherds from the fields, and bring them all together to that one scene that we call out as peace on earth, goodwill to men. Not everyone gets excited about Christmas. Have you guys ever met someone that wasn't real crazy about Christmas? I was in like retail many, many years ago, and this lady was coming through, and I was like, Merry Christmas! And she was like, Jesus wasn't even born on the 25th. Yeah, but Merry Christmas anyways. <laughs> so, some people are not very crazy about Christmas. I want to do a couple quotes for you guys from people who are not crazy about it. It's always consoling to know that today's Christmas gifts are tomorrow's garage sales. Yikes. Bah humbug, everybody. Christmas is a baby shower that went totally overboard. Bah humbug, Absolutely. Mail your packages early so the post office or Amazon can lose them in time for Christmas. Bah humbug. I hate the radio this time of year because they play All I Want for Christmas is You like every other song. And that's just not enough for me. Bah humbug. Last one. It's that special time of year when your whole family gathers together in one place to look at their cell phones. Some of you are like, that's true. That hits, that lets a little, hits a little too close to home. All right. While there's things that people don't like about Christmas, the same thing would have been true about the first Christmas, and we're going to wrap this up with this. Listen to the way the angel describes things to Mary. Listen to the way the promise is given. Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 33. And think about this in context to all the things that we talked about, what it meant to have baby Jesus. Okay, listen to the promise. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor. Everyone say favor. With God. Doesn't that sound like things are going to unfold real well? You got favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus or Yeshua, which means Savior. He will be great. Everyone say great. And he will be called the son of the what? Most high. This sounds great right now. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Everyone say the throne. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants when? Forever. His kingdom will never end. Based on that promise, sign me up. I'll take three of those, Gabriel. But contrast the promise with the process. The angel tells her the promise, but she doesn't know what the process is going to look like. He is going to be king. He is going to reign forever, but it's going to go through the cross. There is going to be a price that will have to be paid. You see, the promise is amazing, but the process is excruciating. There's so many times when we get excited about the promises of God, and we're like, yes, I want that. But we're not willing to go through the process to get to it. We're not willing to go. We started this whole series, Joyful and Triumphant, with the song, O Come All Ye Faithful, Joyful and Triumphant. Joyful and Triumphant. And we looked at the ascension. We looked at the resurrection. We looked at communion. And today we've looked at the birth of Jesus. And the birth teaches us that the process doesn't always feel joyful and triumphant. It's not always going to look joyful and triumphant. Mary and Joseph not being able to stay in the end didn't look joyful and triumphant. Having to travel 80 miles, nine months pregnant didn't look joyful and triumphant. But we can trust God with the end results. When we find ourselves in our own manger moments, we can think back to Mary who said, I am the Lord's servant. Be it unto me your will. If the manger comes before majesty, so be it. 
If it takes waddling 80 miles to further God's kingdom, so be it. If the shepherds get angels and I get noisy animals and a little drummer boy, so be it. What's your manger moment this Christmas season? What's that thing that you would rather not have to deal with? The process that leads to the promise. And are you willing to say like Mary, I am the Lord's servant because we can be joyful because he's triumphant. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the reminder that your promises are amazing. And you do have a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. But sometimes that process goes through some manger moments, through some things that we don't quite understand. How does this connect to all the things that you have said? And God, it's at this time that we have to trust. And we look back at that first Christmas and we see over and over and over again with plot twist after plot twist after plot twist that it led Jesus exactly where he needed to be. And Father, we need to trust you with the process as well. In your name, amen. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For to us a child is born, Son of God and Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God and Holy One. He shall reign forever and ever on his blessed throne above. So Thy holy face with
Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has, been, has, that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Just a brief reminder, we do not have church here tomorrow. We will see you next Sunday at 11 o'clock for a one time only. We're doing it later, so you, those of you guys who are going to be out late the night before, you can still make it to church and start the year out right. Right? All right. Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful Christmas Eve. We'll see you guys next Sunday.